Okay, my name is Lily Petrovic. I've organized this event. I've organized this in order to commemorate the lives lost 10 years ago uh, after 78 days of bombing in uh, Yugoslavia. I have with me today three panelists who are going to be talking about that, all of whom have been spokespeople against NATO aggression. Uh, we have Scott Taylor. He uh, is well known as a war correspondent, ex-Canadian soldier. Uh, he has uh, written several books, many of which are available in our library, uh, one of which is available here for sale after the conference if you're interested in, in purchasing it. Um, we have a clip with, about him, so I don't need to speak too, too much about him. We have David Orchard, national political figure, uh, organic farmer. Last night, David Orchard uh, debated with Dr. Joe Schwartz, and we had a lively debate about that subject. Uh, David Orchard is... Um, a political figure who has spoken outwardly against NATO aggression, and he'll have some things to say about this today, and former Ambassador James Bissett, who was the ambassador in Yugoslavia in the 90s, has written extensively on the subject of the Balkan conflicts and has many articles available also about that. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like them to talk. I'll begin with Scott Taylor, uh, then we'll go to Ambassador uh, Bissett, and then to David Orchard. Um, for Mr. Taylor, I think we can run a clip to show, uh, to give a little introduction about him. A former professional soldier in the Canadian Armed Forces, Scott Taylor, has been editor and publisher of Esprit de Corps magazine since 1988. After exposing a number of top-level cover-ups and scandals while defending the rights of the rank-and-file soldiers, Scott was dubbed the voice of the grunts by the Globe and Mail, a bone in the brass, throats by the Toronto Star, and a one-man army by the Toronto Sun. He has logged over one million air miles as a war correspondent, reporting from such global hotspots as the Persian Gulf, Cambodia, Western Sahara, Croatia, Bosnia, Iraq, Turkey, Yugoslavia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Azerbaijan, and Afghanistan. Since August 2000, Scott has made a total of 21 trips into Iraq to report on the effects of the UN sanctions, the ravages of depleted uranium following the 1991 Gulf War, but returned frequently to Iraq to view firsthand the ongoing humanitarian crisis plaguing this still embattled country. Then, in September 2004, he experienced the rare occasion when getting the story becomes the story. Uh, we were taken first to a house where equipment was taken away from us, and then during the course of the evening we were taken from there to a second house for interrogation. They blindfolded and gagged me, tied my hands on my back. This is for the torture. They, they put me flat on my back and put my leg in the air, tied my feet to a to a pole, played a part, and then started to beat my feet and my legs. And one of them went berserk, which was actually fortuitous. He started to punch my face. His release generated a wave of international media coverage. In spring 2007, Scott Taylor's team, seasoned war correspondents David Pugliese and Australian photojournalist Sasha Uzanov, traveled back to war in Afghanistan for a 10-day journey of investigative reporting outside the wire. I believe we're at your front gate. Just want to confirm. Uh... Through his contacts in the Turkish Embassy in Afghan establishment, Scott Taylor interviewed the notorious warlord turned military commander, Abdul Rashid Dostum. First interview in two years, man. Mm -hmm. We put it together of, of uh, veteran fighters, and, and we fight alongside NATO. Yeah. But take the fight to the top. Senlis Council is part of a controversial effort to convert the illegal opium trade in Afghanistan over to the model used in Turkey and Pakistan where farmers sell their crop directly into the Western pain medication illicit market. The president of Senlis, Canadian Noreen MacDonald, invited Scott to come with Senlis as they conducted an information gathering surveys into the countryside, trying to find out what the Afghan public is really experiencing. This fall, Scott returns outside the wire as the Taliban offensive heads up to investigate how the conflict is affecting the peacekeeping coalition, reconstruction efforts, and the lives of the average Afghan. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, after that all singing, all dancing video, we're going to come down to a little more conventional sort of a slideshow. I realize that today's focus is going to be on the humanitarian, so-called humanitarian intervention into Kosovo 10 years ago. I know a lot of you people probably have a very vague recollection of any of that period in time and don't really understand the very complex root causes for that war. What I wanted to show from this intro um, and what I'll go through my slides is that I sort of get the, the worm's eye view. I was in Belgrade and Kosovo during that bombing campaign, reporting on it from that side. Um, I felt strong enough about the lies that were being told, the propaganda that was being sold to Canadians, that I would go in there at personal risk and report on what was the suffering of the Serbian people who at that time were being told to Canadians that they were in fact the enemy. The Canadian Air Force took place or took part in 10% of the bombing campaign, 10% of the bombs dropped were Canadian. Um, and again, it wasn't justifiable here. The fact that I run a military magazine, people said you got to be crazy to go in there during a time of war when the Canadian military is fighting the war. You should be honoring what our soldiers are doing, not humanizing the enemy. Well, having spent all those years covering the Balkans, meeting the Serbs, the, the Bosnian Muslims, the Croats, everybody else, everybody is people, and there was no way I could believe that the way that the Serbs are being portrayed. That said, um, what you do need to know and understand is that if this humanitarian intervention had been a success, if at the end of the day, the NATO leaders, Canada included, could say, look, we had to break a few eggs to make an omelet. The end result is, is something which we can all take pride in. It would be a different story. Ten years later, we have not solved the problem. And this is the case that uh, what we did then at the time, the amount of human, human suffering that we created, that Canada created, we don't want to see ourselves in that light, but what we did, um, did not end the suffering. It didn't even put it on the road to ending that suffering. So I'm going to switch to uh, slides. Um, these are just taken. This was uh, in Kosovo at the time that they signed the peace agreement in, in June of 1999. I was in there at that time watching the Serbian military come out virtually unscathed. I mean, all the time that the reports been going out of the war, the 78 days bombing, we kept being told, the Western reports were being told that they were denigrating the Serbians' ability to wage war. Hundreds of tanks had been destroyed, thousands of artillery pieces had been destroyed, all the Serbian air force had been destroyed, etc. Obviously, when we drove in, myself and a few international journalists that they were allowed in, we saw that in fact that wasn't true. Almost intact, the Serbian army, and certainly not demoralized, but they came out, um, and only 13 tanks, I believe it was, had been destroyed by NATO air forces in 78 days of bombing. $13 billion worth of smart bombs had been dropped on Kosovo and Serbia to destroy a total of 13 tanks. So obviously very much exaggerated. Um, the revenge killings that we were warned about that would take place as all of the displaced Albanians that had left or fled, uh, 800,000 to a million people that had been forced out that became the focus of the humanitarian crisis that we then had to go in and resolve. But the dates don't jive. We in fact created the humanitarian crisis by dropping bombs, then claimed that because of the number of people that had been evacuated or forced to flee, we had to continue bombing because we had to bring this to a, to a successful conclusion. So the Albanian majority that fled, the Serbian minority, as, as uh, NATO came in, those Albanian refugees came back, the Serbs fled out the other end. So basically like stepping on a water balloon, we took one side, inverted it, and created the suffering and, and horror on the other side. Uh, a lot of the media reported things which weren't, uh, weren't accurate at the time. I know we've only got 15 minutes, but this one in particular, this is when NATO soldiers had just come into Pristina, the, the, the Kosovo capital. There were still Serbian troops, still Albanians on the ground, a lot of disorganization, things going on, shooting going on. And all of a sudden, this huge pillar of smoke came up from behind the main mosque in Pristina. And everybody came out of the Grand Hotel. All the journalists began filming immediately, saying that this was proof that the Serbs had taken a final act of revenge. They had set on fire this main mosque uh, and were burning it to the ground in defiance of NATO. So these stories began to run live, carried live. I mean, the mosque, smoke billowing from it. Me and a, and a Swedish guy walked up the hill to where the mosque was, we walked past the mosque, which was not burning, and found that, in fact, it was a Serbian military headquarters that was on fire, and it was the Muslims that had, uh, the Albanians that had set it on fire when they returned. So again, nobody in that pack of journalists that were propagand propagandizing the war wanted to go on record and correct themselves and said that had they walked 300 meters up the hill, they would have discovered, in fact, they were promoting a falsehood. 
The Serbs, as I said, the Serbian minority, as the Albanian forces in NATO came in, were forced to flee. Um, the journalist that came in chose not to run that story. The fact that the uh, people that were being forced out, I went out on one of the buses, uh, the Serbian buses, crept with refugees. We fled out in those days. There was gauntlets of Albanians that came down into stone and to beat the people as they fled. If they could stop a car, pull the occupants out and beat them, they would. All of this took place within full view of where cameras should have been, but they weren't. The NATO the journalists chose not to film that, and NATO soldiers chose not to intervene. When I got back up into Belgrade, made my report for uh, CBC, I believe it was, and told them what was happening, and the individual on the phone, the producer, said to me, well, those people on your bus, those Serbs, they're probably all war criminals anyway. And I said to him, no, in fact, this is the guy that ran the road next to me. Uh, we were petrified being attacked by the Albanian mob as much as anybody else would have been. But the fact was that when the Albanians were allegedly chased out of Kosovo, it was a tremendous crime against humanity. When the Serbs were chased out in full view of NATO, it was, it was a, an act of vengeance, which was, as the American State Department said, it was understandable or even justifiable. Um, again, people fleeing at the time. This is taken, I mean, once NATO got in there, they thought they were going to create this utopia where all people could live together. This was the idea that, obviously, if the Serbian security forces weren't creating a stable environment for all the Albanians and the, the various minorities in Kosovo to live in harmony, the idea being that when NATO came in, they would put this blanket of unbiased security and make it protected for all people. Some of the things being in, in the, uh, uh, Mandate 1244 was that they were to protect the religious sites of the Serbs, which date back, of course, hundreds of years, and these monasteries, etc., belong to all of us. That never happened. There was an initial wave of, of destruction of the religious sites, a, a wave of killing, revenge killings, chasing the Serbs from the province, chasing them into enclaves, and that erupted again in April or March of 2004. While everyone was watching Iraq, again, there was a massive pogrom in Kosovo perpetrated by the Albanian Muslims, they set fire to all kinds of religious sites, they killed people, they moved off in three-day orgy of violence. Um, again, showing that with 20,000 NATO soldiers, they still couldn't protect religious sites, they couldn't protect people's homes, and they couldn't protect the lives of the people of Kosovo. So again, all these years, that was in 2004, so five years into the intervention, they couldn't stop the violence and they couldn't prevent it, even though that was their mandate. Last year, I went over there just after the declaration of uh, Unilateral Declaration of Independence, I went into Kosovo again, and at that time, I mean, to report on what was obviously being hailed by the Americans and even when the Canes recognized it as an inevitability that we had to create this independent state. Again, not what they claimed when they went in in 1999, it was to protect the Albanian minority and the peace treaty which they signed in 99 was to, to maintain it as sovereign Serb territory. Well, once they declared independence and made it obvious to everybody what was happening, uh, you could see the provocation on the part of the Albanian uh, media in Kosovo directed against the Serbian minority. All this, again, done with full cooperation and funding, by the way, from Canadian, um, from CETA projects, etc., to fund the Albanian media to create and generate inter-ethnic hatred such as this, which speaks for itself. Um, immediately, of course, there was an uh, incident at the border. This was a border point. Violence, uh, the internal border. I don't have time to go on. Um, one of the points I want to make in all this is that from the beginning, the Albanians in Kosovo have been the most honest broker in the whole equation. They have never deferred from what they claim is their ultimate goal, and that is the creation of Greater Albania. Inside Kosovo, the Albanian faction, they wear the Albanian crest on their arm, they, they fly the Albanian flag, it's hard to see, but that is the Albanian flag, it's a black eagle on a red background. Um, the fighters which I've spoken to, the Uchika, the KLA fighters, always carried around a little map in their pockets that reminded them what they're fighting for, for Greater Albania, um, and they've never denied that. The international organizations pretend they've never heard of the phrase. Uh, they still claim, even at the time of the Declaration of Independence in Kosovo, that in fact it was the creation of this new state. Um, but as you can see from these houses, people fly the Albanian flag. More importantly, in Kosovo, on the left is the new flag, the blue and yellow flag of Kosovo that the Americans designed or had a competition to design. This is their military base, and the flag that's flying the highest and the biggest is, of course, the flag of Albania, which is a separate country, supposedly, even though it's neighboring. So again, they, they don't uh, pretend, and you can see on the corner there, too, the guy 
with the beard. I don't think it's clear enough on there. The crest that they're paying homage to a former KLA fighter slash drug dealer slash warlord, um, Adam Yashari. And that, again, in itself, because you've got two ethnic groups that have had all this hatred and violence between them. If you're still living in Kosovo as a Serb, having these guys who are the fighters being honored, and in this case, he was an absolute, absolute criminal. This guy was also a criminal. Uh, he was indicted at The Hague. He spent some time in The Hague for the crimes he committed against both Albanians and Serbs in Kosovo. Um, he's been brought back, and he's now, I believe, he's the, the president of Kosovo, Herodina. They wanted him back at the time, but that's him in his uh, combat mode, and then he put on glasses to make himself look kinder and gentler. These were billboards up at the time when he was actually sitting in a jail cell in The Hague, and believe me, the crimes he committed, he wasn't exonerated. The fact is, he got let go because of lack of evidence. The lack of evidence is that every witness that was signed up to testify is either dead or withdrew. There's about six or seven of them were killed. So ergo, because there's a lack of evidence, he was let was set free. He certainly was not exonerated for the crimes. Again, the same guy, they had posters up in Kosovo saying, we need you now, which was interesting because, of course, the average Albanian doesn't speak English. So this was not aimed at the Albanians. Any international journalist there was, was stupid enough not to realize that this doesn't even have, doesn't even put it in Albanian. So there's no pretense. And, and of course, he was subsequently released, and they claim he was exonerated. Um, there again, huge poster of this guy, Adam Yashari. Uh, he was killed in the very early stages of the uh, uh, insurgency, if you want to call it that, back in 97, 90, 98, um, by Serbian police forces when they still controlled the province. He was gunned down, but everybody knew he was a smuggler. He was a weapons dealer, drug dealer, and he has now become the father of modern Kosovo. They put his picture up everywhere. He doesn't exactly look like uh, uh, John A. McDonald or uh, not just Benjamin Franklin, he's not exactly the father that you'd expect to be of a uh, civilized society. That's a, uh, another graphic of him. The Albanian phrase means basically, we will finish what you started. Um, and essentially that was it. I mean, the, the leadership of Kosovo now is, of course, the former drug dealers, warlords, and, and guerrilla fighters that were there at the time. Not the kind of people you really want running a country. Bill Clinton, that's got to be, look at the size of those windows, that's got to be 70, 80 feet high. Uh, they have no question, I mean, they, again, the Albanians are honest. They know they couldn't have done it without America's help. They love Bill Clinton. There's a street named after Hillary. Um, there's a Hotel Victory, the Statue of Liberty. On top of that is actually owned by one of the Albanian warlords. That's his private and oversized brothel. Um, who wins in this case? Obviously, again, I don't think the average Albanian in Kosovo is going to win if you've got the current leadership that they've got. Um, undemocratic. I mean, there's, there's no independence is something which I mean, I'll question this again. What is independent about Kosovo? People recognize the independence. You've got 17,000 foreign troops still stationed there. It depends entirely upon foreign aid for its economy or its black market, which is the highest drug trade and, and ratio of prostitutes uh, in the world per, per, per capita. And that's not because of the Albanians in Kosovo, it's because of the international community that's there administering the, the, the aid and the soldiers that exist there. So it's, it's a criminal entity supported by foreign money, protected by foreign troops, yet it claims to be independent. And of course, unfortunately, it's run by people he doesn't understand. The Americans love it. This guy, uh, they get to be there. They're welcomed as heroes. Unlike most other places American troops or security forces go, these guys are hailed as heroes by the Albanians because they know that they you know, ultimately owe them their independence. I love this photo because this is one of the things I found that was unique for me to find that the, the major contributor to the actual legal economy in Kosovo is scrap cars. That's the biggest export that they've got is because the highways are so bad, people going through, junk metal is their major export. I mean, if that you can base an independent country on the export of junk metal from, from cars that were destroyed driving your highways, that's not much to go on. Again, the foreign troops that were there, everywhere present. I mean, it's only a tiny couple of valleys, this, and it's a population total base of about 2 million people. So to have 17, 18,000 NATO forces, uh, again, their jurisdiction is in, in dispute as well because it originally had a UN mandate. That mandate expired when they declared independence. No one quite knows what to do with it, so it's now presently being patrolled by U-Force or European Force, uh, which gets really tricky as far as this is writing all new laws and international agreements.
uh, was mentioned earlier in the film today that it isn't just the Serbs that the Albanians don't like living in Kosovo. All the other minorities that were there before, the Turkmens, the Goranis, um, other Bosniaks and Croats that are there, people that were there um, have been chased out. This happens to be a Gorani village down in the south. Uh, Goranis are essentially Serbian ethnic Serbs that converted to Islam, still see themselves as Serbs, not in any way affiliated with the Albanian Muslims. Um, so religion is not a factor here. These people are being chased out of their way of life. That's actually the member of parliament for the Grani uh, village that he's in. It's kind of like a Borat thing. This place, he's the, we got invited to his house. But they're being uh, persecuted by the Albanians who come in, steal their cows, uh, rob from them at gunpoint. That's uh, rush hour in the village, up in the mountains. But their way of life, I mean, it's based on their forests, what they harvest from it, the, the herbs and things that they grow. Um, and what's happening is that the Albanians from Albania, because there is no border in between, um, are coming in and harvesting the entire forest, basically driving them out in terms of uh, eco-vandalism. That's looking down, that, that valley looks down into Albania. There is no border, it's wide open. Um, and the current government, as I said, the Albanians, they see this as the first step towards Greater Albania. There is no internal boundary, nothing, etc. So drugs flow through here, weapons flow through here, and they come in and they, they take out entire uh, forests, which they, they harvest for lumber, which if Kosovo believed itself in any way to be independent from Albania, would definitely put up some sort of boundary. In, inside Canada, we have interprovincial boundaries for trade. Here, they don't seem to mind them coming in and taking the Guaranis trees, because the side effect is, of course, these poor Guaranis are being driven out of their way of life. And there's a German NATO officer telling me exactly what I'm just telling you, and the fact that he's powerless from his command to do anything about it. Um, following the pogrom in 2004, the Serbs that were left in the enclaves that were forced out, the 800 houses that were destroyed, those that chose to stay were given a, a very temporary settlement um, in the form of containers, sea containers that were donated by Russia. To this day, those people are still living in those same containers donated by Russia. No attempt has been made by the international community to improve their lot, uh, to provide them with permanent structures, etc., because ultimately the international community would, would be just as happy if they disappeared, if we ended up at the end of the day, which we will, an almost ethnically pure tiny corner of, of Europe. That's the inside of the sea containers. That's what the uh, Serbian refugees live like inside Kosovo now. Lady there. Again, the graveyards, the fact that the killings go on. I mean, you don't hear about it in the news now because of Iraq and Afghanistan, et cetera. But if you're plugged into those systems, you're hearing about it all the time. Acts of, of provocation against the people trying to force them to leave. So again, they can have an ethnically pure uh, state. And it doesn't stop there. During the pogroms in, in 2004, anywhere they could get a hold of the Serbian graveyards, they desecrated the graveyards. So even the dead are being persecuted by the Albanian majority against the Serbs that were there. There's a couple of shots. That was, I think, a 12-year-old boy that they somehow felt hatred enough to destroy his headstone. That was a uh, newborn that they desecrated the graveyard. And then they also used the Serbian graveyard as a garbage dump, which I know for the Serbs here today it's going to be difficult to see, as opposed to how the Serbs keep their own graveyards in Mitrovica just across the river. This is how they honor their own dead. Obviously, a very big difference. Um, Again, people want to deny the presence of the, the, the roots of the Serbs in the heartland. This is their religious heartland. Um, it truly is, you know, the embodiment of their natural or of their culture. And this, again, people want to deny it. They can't deny the fact that there are still, thank God, a few religious sites that have yet to be destroyed. Uh, and these things belong to all of us, given their age and what they mean to us. And the fact that NATO's turned a blind eye throughout their occupation, it's allowed them to be destroyed. That's, uh, we won't have enough time to get into all the history of it, but that's the um, tower that was erected for Prince Lazar on the Battle of the Plains of Kosovo, the Battle of Kosovo, 1389, a famous moment in Serbian history. They actually lost the battle, but it's remembered as a defining moment, 1389. And of course, the only thing keeping Serbs going to this day, is keeping them there is what we call ENATS, which means stubborn resistance or uh, regardless of the consequences, that spirit which embodies them, um, they will stay there now. People say that they will, regardless of whatever life is, I mean, how dangerous it is and how little they've got inside Kosovo, the Serbs, they will not go because they will not give the satisfaction to the Albanians of seeing them leave. And ENAD is something which 
had NATO forces understood this in the Serbian spirit, would have realized that you're not going to bomb Serbia for five days and have them suddenly submit to your wishes. That campaign went on for 79 days, and in the end it was a negotiated settlement, and that was the only way we could, could bring that to a conclusion. And then we, we reneged on all the agreements that we made to the Serbian people, and that's why we still don't have this thing resolved. And that's that. Um, I know we're tight on time, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give too much detail on that. I know Joe Bissett's going to be uh, able to give you a lot more on the root causes and just how illegal and illogical that intervention was. And I think the fact that myself, um, you may have heard of General Lewis McKenzie. He was a peacekeeping general in Bosnia in 93, spoke out about the fact that the Serbs weren't to blame for everything. He also felt strongly enough in 1999 to risk his life and his reputation, etc., to go into Belgrade to report on the suffering of the Serbian people. So again, that war sold it to people as a humanitarian intervention, end result would, would prove otherwise. So I'm going to cut my talk short there, and I think Joe's next. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Now I call on former Ambassador James Bissett. Thank you very much, uh, Willie, and uh, I'm really delighted to be here at uh, Vanier College. Uh, I think it's very important for the students particularly. Uh, some of you were not very old in 1999 when the bombing started. Uh, to me, it seems just like yesterday, but some of you, I'm sure, had really no idea about where Kosovo was or is and not much interest, and that's true, I'm afraid, for the mass of uh, Canadians who one morning uh, 10 years ago woke up uh, to uh, find that their uh, airmen were bombing uh, uh, Serbia, a uh, modern European country which was no threat to any of its neighbors and uh, were wondering where is this Kosovo and why are we bombing these people. Uh, my reaction when I heard it was uh, quite frankly anger. I had uh, been a diplomat for 36 years, uh, an old Cold War warrior, if you will. Uh, I was very proud of NATO. After all, NATO was the organization that was formed in 1949 by Western European countries, Canada and the United States, to make sure that the uh, USSR, the Soviet Communists, did not overrun uh, Europe. And uh, NATO was designed to protect our freedoms. Uh, article 1 of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was the key article, the founding article, and it said very clearly that NATO was a defensive organization. Uh, NATO would never use or threaten to use force in the, resolu in the resolution of international disputes and would always act in accordance with the United Nations Charter. Uh, and we were proud of NATO. And it did a good job. After the fall of uh, the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the reunification of Germany, people began to wonder why do we have this extremely expensive military organization in the middle of Western Europe? What purpose is it serving? And uh, there were beginning to be increasing demands for the dismantling of that organization. The Warsaw Pact armies had gone home years before, and people, as I said, began to question the, uh, the viability of NATO. That's what, uh, quite frankly, Kosovo was all about. And uh, uh, we began to hear when the bombing started that the Serbs had been persecuting the Albanian population in their Kosovo province, that ethnic cleansing was taking place, uh, Cohen, who is the Secretary of Defense for the United States, claimed that 100,000 young Albanian men were missing. Uh, Clinton, Tony Blair assured us that genocide was taking place and that there was, NATO was justified in its uh, bombing of uh, Serbia to stop the uh, butcher of the Balkans, President Milosevic, from uh, eliminating all of the Albanian population in Kosovo. Uh, we found out later, and we know now, that that those were lies. Our, our political leaders, NATO, were lying to us. Uh, those of you who watched the film before this will know that when the forensic experts 
poured into Kosovo after the Serb security forces had left, they began to look for these 100,000 dead bodies. They haven't been able to find them. Uh, the, la the last count, UN figure, I think is 2,000, 2008 or 2018 bodies have been found. Uh, we were also told that ethnic cleansing was taking place, but if that also was a lie because the mass exodus of Albanians out of Kosovo started when the bombing started, and the United Nations figures have proven that, and I've seen them. Uh, there were a lot of Albanians displaced during the two or three years of quite serious, serious fighting that was taking place in Kosovo, uh, but they did not, they were not refugees, they were displaced from the villages that, where the fighting had taken place. But the mass exodus of Albanians took place after the bombing started. So uh, Kosovo, uh, from my point of view, is a classic example of where uh, humanitarian intervention is used as an excuse or as a cover for other reasons. The major reason for the bombing of Kosovo was to restore in the minds of the public uh, that NATO was a worthwhile organization was a defender of freedom and could be still extremely useful even if it was in the middle of Europe. That's the reason for Kosovo and the bombing. And uh, it's a lesson that we should all uh, learn because it proved very, very convincingly that uh, governments can mislead the people. And uh, a compliant media who are not interested in getting out and really exploring the facts will follow what the government propaganda machine uh, tells them. Uh, not only that, the bombing, of course, was completely illegal. It was in violation of international law, it was in violation of the United Nations Charter, and it was in violation of NATO's own Article 1, which said that it would never use force in the resolution of international disputes, wouldn't even threaten to use force. That's where, in my view, that, that's the most serious consequence of the NATO bombing because it set a dreadful precedent. It showed that the United States led NATO countries would no longer abide by the United Nations Charter and would no longer abide by international law. And in the middle of the bombing, on this was what it was all about, in the middle of the bombing in April uh, of 1999, uh, President Bill Clinton Tony Blair and the other NATO leaders celebrated NATO's 50th birthday. And on that occasion, Bill Clinton, on his own, announced a new role for NATO. And in effect, that new role was, and still is, that NATO now will not have to abide by international law, will not have to abide and act in accordance with the United Nations Charter or the principles of the UN Charter, but will intervene militarily wherever in the world it seems, it feels necessary to do so. And that is where we are now with NATO. And that started because of the bombing of Kosovo. It's gone completely unnoticed. After all, no one in Canadian Parliament debated whether our airmen should participate in the bombing of uh, Serbia. Uh, most of our members of Parliament has, didn't know where Kosovo was. Uh, we, there was no debate or discussion in Parliament. Uh, the Canadian people had nothing to say about whether their airmen would participate in, in the strikes. And you'll see that if, if you've seen the film earlier today, you'll see what those uh, uh, airstrikes did. They had no, no effect whatsoever on the Serb military, but they destroyed the civilian infrastructure of a modern European country. They bombed cigarette factories, automobile factories, they blasted down the bridges on the Danube, which had absolutely no military significance. They destroyed the electrical grid. They hit television stations. They even, as you know, uh, bombed the Chinese embassy. Said it was a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. They'd heard that the Chinese were alerting the Serbs on when flights from Italy were coming in to bomb. And so they took out the Chinese embassy. Uh, this they, they killed over 4,000 civilians, uh, double the casualties that they alleged to had taken place in Kosovo. So, I mean, uh, they were dropping and dropped over 200,000 some cluster bombs on Serbia, 
Many of them are still there. Many of them are still doing damage. Cluster bombs are used not to knock down buildings, but to kill people. They're, they're meant to kill people. Uh, NATO bombed the marketplace in Nish, a city in southern Serbia, in the middle of the afternoon during the market. Killed a lot of elderly people and old women who were out buying their vegetables. All of this was covered up by NATO propaganda machine. And uh, even today, you will hear that NATO's little war in Kosovo was done, uh, achieved its purposes, it stopped genocide, it stopped ethnic cleansing, and it prevented uh, Serbia from uh, uh, maintaining its province of Kosovo. Uh, as Scotting intimated in his talk, uh, even after the, uh, the bombing stop, uh, that is when the real ethnic uh, cleansing took place, but it was, a, it was of the non-Albanian population of Kosovo. And those few Serbs that remain there are, I've been in Kosovo a year ago, the few, the few Serbs that are remaining there, as you can see, are living under dreadful conditions. If they leave the ghetto, uh, they are either beaten at best and murdered at worst. Uh, it's a dreadful situation, and yet no one in the West knows very much about it at all. Uh, when the uh, Taliban blew up the two figures of the Buddhists several years ago, it was headline news around the world. The fact that 150 Christian churches and monasteries have been destroyed in Kosovo, who knows about it? Very few people. The worst part, in my view as well, about the, the bombing of Kosovo is that it was, it was deliberate, it was planned. I'm going to read you uh, an excerpt from the Republican uh, policy council in the United States. Seven months before the bombing, they were discussing the Balkans. Here's a quote. Uh, the U.S. Senate Republican Policy Committee reports that planning for a U.S.-led NATO intervention in Kosovo is largely in place. The only missing element seems to be an event with suitably vivid media coverage that could make the intervention politically uh, assailable. That Clinton is waiting for a trigger is increasingly obvious. That trigger was soon to be pulled. It was the highly suspicious Ratchak massacre that uh, Madeleine Albright said was the, uh, the reason why the bombing took place. At Rambouillet, the so-called Rambouillet uh, peace conference between Serbs and Albanians, the Americans would not allow either the Albanians or the Serbs to meet together face to face. And they decided what the peace term should be. And when it looked as though Milosevic was going to accept the peace terms, the Americans panicked and at the last minute put an Appendix B onto the agreement and sent it to Milosevic. In Appendix B, they had worded it in such a way that they knew no president of Serbia could have accepted it. Two of the provisions, among many others that were objectionable, one was that uh, NATO could have access to all of Serbia and its troops could travel wherever it wanted and would not be subject to Serbian law. Secondly, that within three years there would be a referendum on autonomy for, or independence for the Albanians. Milosevic rejected that and the bombing took place. As the bombing increased, a lot of other European allies and NATO members were beginning to be concerned for 78 days, the most bombing that was taking place in Europe since the end of the Second World War. And German public opinion particularly became concerned, and NATO began to get nervous. They thought that we better stop this war. So they sent uh, the former Russian Prime Minister Chernomidrin, Viktor Chernomidrin, and Mati Hatasari, who is a former Finnish president, to see Milosevic and try and get Milosevic to agree on peace terms. Uh, they asked Milosevic, what, what do you need to have the bombing stop? Milosevic said, no access to Serbia by NATO troops and no referendum in three years for the Albanian population uh, on independence. Mati Hatasari and Chernomidran brought that back to NATO and NATO agreed and the bombing stopped. What started the war? Those two provisions of Appendix B. What stopped it 78 days later? When NATO, not Milosevic, NATO gave way and accepted Milosevic's terms. So it was a totally avoidable war, an unnecessary war. But NATO came out of it very proud and very smiling. It had a renewed agenda. It had new terms of reference. 
it could do now whatever it wanted to do. And it's been doing that ever since. Uh, you know, this is, this is part of the problem. And the public uh, don't really know, and most of the media don't care. If you've seen uh, George's movie, at The Avoidable War, uh, that has not been shown widely, and it never will be, because the mainstream media will not show it. Because my time must almost be up, I think. But uh, what I want to say is that we're part of that. We can blame it all we want on the United States. And uh, indeed, they are primarily responsible. I mean, they're spending billions of dollars every day on defense. The total U.S. budget is more than the rest of the world combined, including China and Russia. They have military presence in 160 different countries. Uh, even the, the extremely difficult financial situation the Americans now find themselves in, and all of the bailout of the banks and other uh, organizations and businesses, they are not cutting back on their defense budget and they're going to be sending more and more troops into Afghanistan. So while many of us had hoped that with Obama, a new president, there might be a change in policy, it doesn't look to me as though there's going to be. And when he appoints the old Kosovo hands, like Holbrook and Madeleine Albright and Hillary Clinton into the positions that they're now in, it doesn't look good for the future in terms of uh, bringing NATO back to where it should be making Article One still be the founding article of NATO and inviting uh, the Russians into it. Uh, why should we be ringing Russia with a ring of steel? The Cold War is over, uh, but uh, the Americans seem insistent on, on continuing it. And they're putting, uh, you know, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, uh, aimed at Russia. They're, they're putting uh, missile units in Poland, in Hungary, uh, they've got military maneuvers going on in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, after violating uh, all of international law and declaring uh, uh, Kosovo to be an independent state, again in violation of the Charter, in violation of all of the principles that we stood for, state sovereignty, territorial integrity, uh, they've completely closed their eyes to that and went ahead and did what they want to do, despite the warning from Putin, from Russia, he said, look, you can't do this, it's illegal, it's contrary to all law, it's a violation as well of the Helsinki Final Accords, uh, you can't do this, but if you do, you set a precedent that I will follow. And if you give Kosovo its independence, I have much more justification in giving Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and uh, Transnistria its independence. And you're setting a precedent for people all around the world who want to declare independence to do so, and to do so by violence. So please don't go ahead with it. Uh, the Americans, and indeed most of the NATO countries, not all of them, uh, have recognized Kosovo. It's not an independent state. It's a failed state. It's a criminal narco state. And only about 60 countries have recognized. Uh, not all of the NATO countries have recognized. Spain has not. Greece has not. Slovakia has not. Because they, they know international law much better than uh, the Americans do. I regret to say that Canada did recognize Kosovo independence, but there was terrific pressure from our neighbor to do so. The fact of the matter is, uh, out of the 190-some countries of the United Nations, only 60 have recognized Kosovo. That'll give you an idea that the rest of the world does not buy into uh, everything that NATO does. Uh, my final plea to you is that uh, uh, the real essence of a democracy is that citizens be alert and be knowledgeable. And to be careful what you read in the newspapers and hear in the radio, and particularly careful about what governments tell you. They're not always telling you the truth. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bissett. Those who have another class to go to, please do sit quietly right now, and uh, Mr. David Orchard will continue. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lily. Uh, I'd like to commend the organizers uh, uh, of this event, uh, Lily Petrovich uh, and the others uh, who organized uh, the commemoration of the 10th anniversary 
uh, of the bombing of Yugoslavia. And it's a pleasure to be on the panel with uh, Ambassador uh, Bissett and, and, and Scott Taylor uh, today. Ambassador Bissett and I were, uh, were part of the uh, ad hoc committee to stop Canada's participation in the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999, uh, along with uh, Mary Elena Repo, Michael Mendel, David Jacobs, Michelle Chosodowski, Ursula Franklin, Rosalie Bertel, Roly Keith, Michael Bliss, and others. And Scott Taylor, of course, spoke out uh, and wrote uh, powerfully at demonstrations and events across the country against the bombing. As was mentioned here 10 years ago today, the most powerful military alliance in the history of the world began bombing uh, little Yugoslavia, and they did it for 78 days. NATO, the North, American, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, uh, is headed by the United States, as was mentioned. The supreme commander of NATO is always an American general, and it was set up after the Second World War as a defensive alliance. But here it was bombing Yugoslavia, which is a small European country under half the size of my home province, Saskatchewan, an ethnically mixed federal state with originally about 24 million inhabitants. It had been a strong and a staunch ally against both German and Italian fascism during World War II. They lost one and a half million people in fighting in the forefronts against, against fascism. And now we were part of an unprovoked attack against our former ally. And in an article that I wrote during the bombing, I called the bombing of Yugoslavia one of the defining moments of the 20th century. It set the stage and provided the model for the invasion of Afghanistan two years later and then the assault on U.S. assault and occupation of Iraq. And it provided a, it was a stage for an all-out intellectual justification for the overthrow of international law, as Ambassador Bissett has mentioned, and its replacement essentially by the rule of the powerful. The NATO attack on Yugoslavia was illegal on a host of fronts. Even the attacking countries couldn't deny that, so they coined their phrase illegal but legitimate. And they made it clear that they were above international law. Michael Mandel, the professor of international law at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto, called the attack by NATO, and I'll quote, a terrible crime against humanity a crime against international law and the Charter of the UN, and a crime against history, a crime against the truth. And we have uh, Professor Mendel's articles on the table out uh, at the back, a bunch of material you can pick up. We have Ambassador Bissett's articles that he wrote at the time, and, and a number of others as well. But during the bombing, Professor Mendel and a group of lawyers demanded that NATO leaders be investigated for war crimes, and they submitted a large dossier to the International Criminal Tribune at The Hague, and uh, ask them to investigate, which they refused to do. International law and the UN Charter explicitly state that the only justification for lethal force by one country against another is under a case of self-defense, and self-defense is defined quite narrowly as being under direct and ongoing attack yourself, or if it's been authorized by the United Nations Security Council. Neither of those uh, were had occurred in the case of Yugoslavia. The Nuremberg Tribunal, which tried Germany's leaders after World War II, ruled that to initiate a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime. And yet this is what Canada and its NATO allies did in Yugoslavia, which had not attacked Canada. Yugoslavia had not threatened any of its neighbors. It had not attacked or threatened any NATO country which was now flying over it, dropping bombs. During that 78-day assault, NATO dropped 23,000 bombs and cruise missiles on a virtually defenseless nation. Over 100 schools and churches were hit. Power stations, oil refineries, factories, and chemical plants were hit, discharging their toxic materials into the air and the water. Trains, train stations, apartment buildings, bridges, some 4,000 were killed and 10,000 wounded, most of them civilians. And because media, NATO didn't like the media coverage from Belgrade of the war, they bombed the television station in Yugoslavia's capital, incinerating 12 young journalists and burying them under the rubble. And as Ambassador DeBissett mentioned, China had opposed the attack at the UN and their embassy in Belgrade was bombed. NATO used internationally outlawed cluster bombs and in a fact that received almost no publicity, NATO, uh, the United States used missiles containing depleted uranium ammunition 
when these missiles hardened with depleted uranium vaporize on impact, their deadly DU spreads all over. It's breathed in by the people, and it becomes a deadly radioactive legacy for all eternity. And most of the DU in U.S. weapons is coming from Canada, from my home province of Saskatchewan, which is the largest supplier of uranium to the United States. I wrote an article right during the war, during the bombing. It was published by the Globe and Mail, and they cut out my sentence referring to the use of depleted uranium. I found newspapers across the country would cut out the passages in my articles in which I referred to depleted uranium. I phoned the Globe and Mail. I said, why did you cut that sentence out? They said, well, you can't prove it. I said, the Pentagon themselves have admitted that they're using depleted uranium ammunition. The US A-10 Warthogs use it, the, the, the missiles that are being fired from the tanks. But that's the kind of silence that reigns in our country and, and many around the world about the use of this weaponry that is absolutely inexcusable. And in Canada, as the ambassador mentioned, there was almost a, a virtual unanimity of support there was almost a complete lack of political opposition. All the parties in our House of Commons supported the attack, backed by wall-to-wall -wall media coverage. And it was our horror at this complicity and the lack of dissenting voices that led the group of us, as I mentioned, uh, to come together and speak on behalf of all of those who didn't want our country to be part of this action. NATO's own charter had stated it was a defensive organization, so why had it launched this attack on Yugoslavia? And why had the Western media for 10 years demonized the Serbian people and their leaders, labeling them essentially as, uh, as bloodthirsty monsters? This term, humanitarian bombing mission, was coined by NATO and used by Canadian government officials who claimed that NATO was bombing Yugoslavia to stop the Serbs from ethnically cleansing the Albanian population, as had been mentioned by, by both Scott and Joe Bissett. Yet, as it has been pointed out, so often, the exodus of people under, out of Kosovo began after the bombing. It was a result of the bombing. It was people fleeing from our bombs, fleeing for their lives. NATO also actually remarkably stated that it was bombing Yugoslavia to force it to sign the Rambouillet Peace Agreement. Yet international law states clearly that a treaty obtained by force or the threat of force is void. Among its terms, the Rambouillet Treaty stated that the economy of Kosovo shall, and I quote, shall function in accordance with free market principles and allow the free movement of goods and capital in and out of the country. Yugoslavia had resisted the wholesale push for privatization and globalization. It had a domestically controlled mixed economy with a strong publicly owned sector. It had its own pharmaceutical industry, its own aircraft industry, its own automobile, the, the Yugo, and it refused to allow U.S. bases on its soil. In fact, during the bombing, of course, the Yugo factory was, was blown to rubble. But Yugoslavia became a target nation. The bombing was the culmination of a decade-long push by the Western powers led by the United States and Germany to forcibly dismantle the country. In 1999, the republics of Slovenia and Croatia elected separatist governments, which unilaterally declared themselves sovereign states. The Yugoslavian federal court ruled that the question of secession could only be decided with the agreement of the republics. The breakaway republics rejected the court's, federal court's jurisdiction, and the Germany, and Germany, the U.S., and Canada recognized these new states, triggering a decade of civil war. During the bombing in 1999, U.S. President Clinton said, if we're going to have a strong economic relationship that includes our ability to sell around the world, Europe has got to be the key. That's what this Kosovo thing is all about. It's globalism versus tribalism. And in the New York Times, just four days into the bombing, columnist Thomas Friedman wrote, for globalization to work, America can't be afraid to act like the almighty superpower that it is. The hidden hand of the market will never work without a hidden fist. McDonald's cannot flourish without McDonnell Douglas, the designer of the F-15. And the hidden fist that keeps the world safe for Silicon Valley's technologies is called the United States Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. And as the bombing went on, NATO admitted its intention was to break Yugoslavia's spirit. 
And this prompted the famous Soviet writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn to say, he said, I don't see any difference in the behavior of NATO and of Hitler. NATO wants to erect its own order in the world and it needs Yugoslavia simply as an example. We'll punish Yugoslavia and the whole rest of the planet will tremble. After the bombing, of course, there was a widespread privatization and sell-off for a song of uh, Yugoslavia's resources, their industries, to foreign owners. Yugoslavia went from an upper, upper middle income country, an advanced technological nation, to one near the bottom of world charts. The unemployment rate in Kosovo hit 50%. And the United States built its largest military base in Europe in Kosovo. And some three years after the bombing, Patty Ashdown, the appointed governor of Bosnia, one of Yugoslavia's former republics, told a conference on foreign investors in London that they had, quote, managed to clear away the debris of the formerly socialist economy and open up the countries to international markets and investment. So the impunity with which Western powers destroyed Yugoslavia served as a model and a precedent. Two years later, using the same motto of protecting human rights, the United States attacked and occupied Afghanistan under its Operation Enduring Freedom. And again, in clear violation and contempt for international law. And the U.S. occupation continues to this day and, of course, is supported by Canada and Afghanistan, where we have spent billions, and doll billions of dollars and seen the loss of 116 of our soldiers. And then in March 2003, offering a similar justification, the U.S. launched its all-out shock and awe assault invasion and occupation of Iraq. Iraq is another small country, roughly two-thirds the size of Manitoba. It had been under sanctions for 10 years, had an average wage of about a dollar a day by that time, and no way of defending itself. Yet the U.S., which has more weapons of mass destruction than all the rest of the world put together, accused Iraq of having weapons of mass destruction or wanting to have them. This was a total fabrication, much like the myth that Yugoslavia was being bombed to stop ethnic cleansing. The United States called their attack on Iraq Operation Iraqi Freedom and declared it was going to build democracy in Iraq. This was another blatant crime against humanity and international law, using a whole arsenal of illegal weapons, and this brutal occupation is still going on in Iraq. The United States has now used over 3,000 tons of uranium, depleted uranium ammunition in Iraq and Afghanistan. What's essentially happening is that low-level nuclear war is being waged in those two countries against the civilians. In centuries past, wars were often fought, usually fought between armies that fought and killed one another. Now, it's powerful nations waging high-tech, indescribably brutal war largely against civilians. And to date, over one million Iraqis have been killed and hundreds of thousands horribly wounded. Out of a total population of some 20 million, 2 million have fled the country, and another 2 million are what's called internally displaced. The agony of that country has not begun to be known by the country by, in, in the world at large. Iraq is one of the world's largest suppliers of oil. In the lead up to its attack, the United States had demanded that Iraq privatize its oil reserves, which the country refused to do. And under the occupation, the Iraqis have also seen their country privatized and handed out to foreign owners. Their president was captured by U.S. forces, tried in a show trial, and executed, as were many of the other leaders. To its credit, Canada, under Mr. Kretchen's leadership, and thanks to strong opposition in your province, Quebec, Canada refused to join the attack on Iraq. But Canada has been playing a key role on the world stage to defend and promote this idea of humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect. We're told that the powerful nations of the West have the right to invade and protect the citizens of so-called failed states, and it's the West that defines which is a failed state, from their own governments if their governments don't behave properly. This doctrine has now been adopted by the UN, and one of the first official examples of this doctrine in practice was, was Canada helping France and the United States overturn the democratically elected government of Jean Bertrand de Steed 
in Haiti in 2004, throwing that country into chaos which continues as we speak. And the same line is now being used to promote intervention in Darfur, Zimbabwe, even Venezuela, which we're told is not behaving properly. In all these examples, we're seeing powerful Western countries led by the United States and the old colonial powers of Britain and France, and increasingly now, as was mentioned, Germany, imposing or attempting to impose their will on small nations using the most horrific of modern weapons and the powerful propaganda of the mass media to legitimize their actions. And the Yugoslavian model was key in this development. As the American writer Diana, Diana Johnson wrote in her book, Fool's Crusade, Yugoslavia, NATO, and Western Delusion, she said, should the tough unilateralist approach of the second Bush presidency cause serious disaffection among allies, U.S. leaders have the option of returning to the soft approach of humanitarian war that proved so successful in silencing the critics and rallying support in Yugoslavia. And her words are proving remarkably prescient. We have Diana Johnson's powerful book on the table at the back as well. Most recently, as was mentioned earlier, the Unilateral Declaration of Independence by Kosovo, which was recognized by the U.S., the Europeans, and Canada, is also with its illegal, and its acceptance has implications for all federal states, including Canada. In fact, the parallels between Canada as a federal state and Yugoslavia as a federal state are very uh, instructive, and Canada should be taking note uh, of what they are. In the past, Canada gained an enviable reputation around the world largely because it refused to invade or try to raise its flag over other countries on the planet. In the 10-year-long U.S. attack on Vietnam, the unspeakable war, Canada refused to send troops. Six million died or were wounded under the reign of U.S. bombs and biological and chemical weapons in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. I had a chance to visit Vietnam about 10 years ago. The hospitals there are still full of hundreds of thousands of victims of Agent Orange and other chemicals that the United States used. Canada refused to help the U.S. attack and the blockade Cuba in the 60s. And when the United States invaded the island of Grenada, Prime Minister Trudeau condemned the action in 1983. But over the past decades, and as our country and our economy has integrated more deeply into that of the United States under the so-called free trade agreement, NAFTA, two agreements which most Canadians opposed. Canada has more and more taken the role of helping the United States in its invasions around the world. Canada has the potential to stand on its own two feet and play an independent role in the world. And at key moments in the past, Canada has been a voice for the rights of all nations to live in freedom and the fear of attack by rich and powerful countries. This is a legacy to which we must return for our sake and for the sake of the world. So I want to wind up and I look forward to the question period, but I want to mention that we have on the back a whole range of material about this conflict, the articles by Ambassador Bissett, Rosalie Bertel, Mary Lynn Repo, Michael Mandel, myself and others, and Diana Johnson's book, and an excellent overview in monthly review. It's a small publication, uh, but it's got an excellent review of what's happened in Yugoslavia. And of course, we have Professor Michael Mandel's book, and John Berkman's book, Humanitarian Intervention. All of these are wonderful materials to understand what's happened there and some of the implications for our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Orchard. Just to let you know also, for the students at Vanier, we have all of those books available at our library. Um, Diana Johnstone couldn't be here today. She's at a conference in Italy, but she's written a statement to be read, which will be read at 2 o'clock, if you can stay for that. Uh, we'll take questions. Uh, there are two microphones on either side, and I'll just call on people. The speakers will stay in their places there and answer the questions. Uh, you can also mention to whom your question is directed. Well, personally, I, I don't think we should be in Afghanistan. I think that's pretty clear, and I hope that we soon get out of there. Just as a matter of interest, I have a son who's in Kandahar. Uh, he's not with the military, but believe it or not, he's working with NATO. Despite that, uh, his, his father continues to be a very severe, severe critic of the organization. No, I think uh, clearly that while I'm a strong supporter of our troops, 
and I hate to see that figure 116, as I'm sure all of us do. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to do much good there, and the sooner we get out, the better. But uh, that's that's my comment. I think Scott, who's been there, will probably have more to say about it, but I'll pass this on to David first. Thank you very much. Well, I opposed our involvement in Afghanistan from the very beginning. Uh, again, you don't. We were told that Afghanistan had harbored Bin Laden and his associates, and we demanded, the West demanded that uh, Afghanistan give them up. Actually, Afghanistan said, present some evidence to us, and, and we'll consider it. But uh, uh, the, then the, the U.S. simply overruled all international law and attacked the country. You can't do that under international law. You can't say, I think you're harboring someone, uh, and we're going to bomb your country. But uh, now Canada is involved in that, and I think in the end we're going to be driven out of there with our tail between our legs, and we're going to have expended billions of dollars and and uh, and shed far too much blood before we get out. And I think that all we can do now is to get out as soon as we can. Um, I, I can't paint a much rosier picture than that, I'm afraid. But I think the key in here is that, that we didn't really understand the Balkans. We didn't understand the Serb mentality and people we believed our propaganda that and we demonized them into genocidal maniacs. We had to get involved. We had to intervene. Afghanistan, um, we focused on the burqa. We focused on different things that we're going to free these people and, and basically recreate them in our own image. You can't do that. I mean, we've gone into Afghanistan. We've gone in there blind. Um, we're not just coming in from a different country. We're coming in from a different century, a different religion, an entirely different value system. Uh, and the way that we've approached it, doing it as quickly as we can, as cheaply as we can, means that we've created monsters in Afghanistan um, that we need to admit before we can ever move on and have a successful conclusion. And just one example being the police force, and I go over this all the time. We got in there and people said in order to create a secure environment, you need to have police on the street. So we started to train police. If they were illiterate, they got two weeks training. If they were literate, they got four weeks training. A Kalashnikov, a badge, and they were sent on the streets. These people in a country where for 30 years it's been constant warfare, they don't see people with a uniform as people you can trust, I mean, and nor should they when they're illiterate. We wouldn't put an illiterate with a Kalashnikov on the streets of Montreal and expect them to enforce the law. They can't even read a parking ticket. They can't read a security badge. We've created 37,500 of these monsters that are out on the streets now. They, in fact, are the, one of the biggest detriments to security because we wanted to do this quickly and cheaply, etc. Only now, seven and a half years into this uh, experiment that we decided that we should probably train at least the supervisors how to read to a grade four level. If we approach this in Afghanistan the same way, we're never going to get out of there with anything but a mess. I mean, and that's something which, understanding that, we have to have the same value system on life and the same value system for education. Question on this side? Yes, so when I hear your presentations, uh, it, seem, it sounds to me like this NATO is a military mafia, and 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 I'm wondering, and I'm wondering, uh, is it a, if it's a proxy for the UN, then we're in serious trouble, because I w the thought came to me that in the Middle East, if NATO is hanging up over everybody else's head, we're never going to solve the problem in the Middle East. So uh, what can we do with our governments to get them to shake them up and and uh, and lobby them to uh, to come to their senses about NATO? Mr. Orchard might want to take that question right off the bat, but then we'll open it to everyone. Well, I think you know that that's precisely my point. I mean, NATO was uh, an organization that was needed during the Cold War, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the return to barracks of all of the Warsaw Pact armies, uh, we should have either dismantled NATO, or if we had felt it had to continue uh, as a enforcer for the United Nations, then we should have ensured that Article 1 of its treaty got uh, foremost attention. That is, that it wouldn't use force, uh, or even threaten to use force, without UN Security Council approval. But Kosovo changed that all around, and what's happened, of course, is that now NATO is indeed simply a front or a cover for U.S. Uh, uh, military and foreign policy objectives. So the lobbying that we should do to our, our own government is to say, look, Article 1 of the North Atlantic Treaty it still stands, and our government should insist that it, it take prominence. 
the only article of NATO that you hear now from the Americans and from our own government is Article 5, which says that if one member of NATO is attacked, all of the others uh, are at least morally bound to, to uh, come to their defense. Uh, you never hear anyone mention Article 1. But North, the North Atlantic Treaty is a treaty, uh, and all of its uh, articles still stand because nothing has come back to the Canadian Parliament to say that NATO's uh, the treaty should be amended and Parliament should vote on the amendments. Uh, they've just it's, This has been done by an announcement on NATO's 50th birthday by Bill Clinton, and uh, everybody's accepted that. So I think we anybody who doesn't like NATO or feels NATO's uh, uh, you know, a bad organization, which I share, should lobby our government to insist that it go back to its original purpose. I mean, it's the most dangerous organization I think that exists because we're going we're going to get into serious trouble with China and with Russia. I mean, uh, Putin warned uh, the Americans that the recognition of Kosovo as an independent state was wrong, was against the law, was a violation of Serbia's inter uh, internet, uh, uh, geographical integrity and sovereignty, and that if they did it, he would look upon that as a precedent, and he would recognize the independence of South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and Transnistria, as I mentioned in my talk. Uh, and he's done that. Uh, the the uh, invasion of Abkhazia and South Ossetia this last summer was a pretty tricky uh, uh, incident, and had Georgia been a member of NATO, Canada and the rest of NATO would have obliged, would have been obliged to come to the help of NATO or to Georgia. Uh, so you could imagine what that might have triggered off. I mean, you know, the Soviet Union or the Russia today has got all of the old Soviet Union anti uh, ballistic missiles, uh, and many of them are pointed right at the heart of North America. Uh, it's still an extremely dangerous situation. But the Americans, through NATO, seem to be constantly doing everything they can to provoke the bear. The bear wasn't very strong under Yeltsin, but under Putin, it's a different thing. Well, military alliances are always uh, tricky and many times dangerous things. And uh, NATO was Canada's first peacetime military alliance, and I think it's time for a clear, hard-nosed uh, look at NATO, exactly as Ambassador Bissett has mentioned. It, NATO is run by the United States. Its supreme commander is always an American, as I mentioned. And uh, we are operating in Afghanistan, uh, so ostensibly now, we, we went in under U.S. command. Now we're, uh, we're, uh, we're operating under NATO. Uh, but uh, this whole idea in Afghanistan that we're going to bomb to produce freedoms uh, we're bombing to help the women and children, we're told. We're bombing to help the, the girls go to school, which the Taliban wouldn't let them do. But one of the, the, the Afghan Women's Associations has pointed out that but bombing us with depleted uranium is the most horrendous thing you can possibly do, and trying to justify that in terms of bringing freedom to, to women is, uh, is horrendous. But that's now what we're doing, and we're allied with the United States that uses this kind of uh, weaponry. Some countries have led the fight. Belgium has banned uh, depleted uranium. They've led, led the fight in terms of keeping it out of their ports. And yet Canada, we, we're going along saying we're Boy Scouts, we don't sell our uranium to, for use in weapons around the world, but it turns out we're the largest supplier to the Americans. And so we're living in this fantasy land somehow uh, that uh, we're good and all that, but at the same time we can lend our planes to help bomb the Yugoslavs and we can send our uranium to be used in these weapons and we can help fight over there, but we're still actually really good. I think the issue is we've got to stand on our own two feet and uh, I've written an article actually, it was just published in the papers a couple of days ago, it's called Standing on Our Own Two Feet and we have to get back some kind of control of our own independence, cease being a satellite. The founders of Canada saw Canada as being a major continental power, John A. MacDonald, Cartier, and the, all the others. They saw us as being a satellite to no one, and yet our current leaders have seem to have no vision whatsoever of Canada as an independent country standing on the world, two sta on the world stage on its own two feet. And we have to start by uh, building our own economy instead of giving it all away because what follows from that, of course, is following the United States on the, on the world stage. Canada could take a much more powerful 
role, as was uh, as Joe just mentioned here. If we would raise our voice, even if we're in NATO, we could raise our voice. I mean, some NATO countries didn't participate in the bombing of Yugoslavia. We could have spoken out inside NATO against that operation, uh, and uh, and we could take a much uh, more direct and influential role in the world. But instead, we're simply uh, following along, uh, and you know. Just this, one last comment. Some of you might follow. George Galloway has been prohibited from entering Canada because he made so bold as to uh, uh, criticize the war in Afghanistan and uh, give the U.S. Congress a heated exchange a few years ago. So now we've banned him out of Canada. This kind of approach from our government uh, has got to be the only way we reject it is by, is by the citizens raising their voices. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to add a quick point to Joe's comment about the Article 5 and how it's being used here. People, a lot of military pundits are saying that NATO's big challenge in Afghanistan, of course, is the fact that they're not, everyone's not stepping up to the plate and that Article 5, we should come to mutual defense. Now, that clause means that if one country in NATO is attacked, I mean, if they're invaded, then the rest of us come to their defense. Putting our troops into southern Afghanistan and then being attacked by the Taliban does not qualify as an attack upon Canada, I mean, et cetera. So when they start using that, I mean, that's when you say, man, you've gone too far. I mean, this whole NATO as an alliance, I mean, yes, it's lost its purpose. Uh, it needs to be redefined. We have a question on this side. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Nadia Alexa, and I'm the founder of Citizens in Action, uh, an organization uh, that uh, uh, wants justice and uh, economic justice and social justice. And I would just like to point out that we have invited uh, Julius Gray, the famous lawyer, for the 15th of April to speak about uh, the failure of the um, uh, neoliberal agenda. Having said that, um, I uh, am no defender of uh, warfare or warmongering or our, uh, our position in Afghanistan. I definitely don't agree with it. However, I want to understand what do you do about people like the uh, president of Darfur uh, when people commit genocide as they are in Darfur or uh, uh, Mugabe who has been uh, killing his people with uh, impunity or uh, for example in, um, in Yugoslavia when thousands of Muslims were killed and buried and nobody uh, said anything about I mean, what do you do? when such um, uh, uh, people act with impunity to kill their own people. I need to know what you do about it. Well, maybe I could start, uh, this is uh, Alexander. What uh, did the world do when the United States tried to wipe out its Aboriginal people? What did it do when Canada has behaved in a bad way? Did it come and bomb us? The answer is not for us to set ourselves up in terms of judging the world and saying you behave in a certain way. First of all, in Zimbabwe, we have to start to understand a little bit. What did the European powers do in Zimbabwe in terms of colonization, in terms of slavery, in terms of, of essentially destroying the society there? Uh, all of those things have to be looked at. Instead, we're just saying, okay, this is a bad thing. White farmers are being driven off their land. It's absolutely terrible. The government's terrible. So what we maybe go in and do is what? Go in and bomb? That's what we've done in Afghanistan, and it makes the situation even worse. So, and in, in Haiti, if I can mention Haiti, Haiti was the first country in the Western world to overthrow slavery, and they had to pay reparations to France for a hundred years after doing that, for being so bold as to throw uh, the French slave owners out of business. And uh, now we're involved in Haiti where we overthrew the first democratically elected government in that country's history. And we're part of, of occupying Haiti. So we're not solving these problems. There's many, many other ways to look at the problems that we're seeing around the world. There's ways of solving them. And it doesn't involve going in and bombing them with high-tech weaponry. Is there some kind of mechanism that we can use internationally? I'm not talking about uh, the rich countries bombing the poor countries. I'm wondering if there is such a kind of thing as a mechanism by which these people could be called upon to go to court or to be... Um, uh, uh, they, 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 they've got to stop killing their own people, and I don't know. I'm asking you, what do we do about it? 
Yes, well, you can, you go under, under what moral authorities? I mean, do we not put then George Bush on trial for all the people he killed in Iraq? I mean, do we not arrest him? When he comes to Calgary, we arrest him and say you're going to stand trial for the million people you killed? Who's going to be? They're not, uh, Americans didn't subscribe to the international court. They established it, but they refused to submit to it. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking while you're speaking. Please. No one's ever used weapons of mass destruction except America. Yeah, that's right. The only people in history. But they're the ones passing judgment on who can have them and who can't. But again, I mean, every war that I've ever covered, if you scratch the surface, there's been some money reason behind it throughout history, through everything else. I mean, always is the reason. We put out the humanitarian explanations as to why we've got to get involved because we know it's popular. That was why they magnified the numbers, as we saw in the movie, about the numbers that were being killed in Kosovo, so we continued to bomb. At the end of the day, those numbers didn't prove to materialize, but it was already done. It was too late. So don't always believe what you're being told. If enough people are being oppressed inside a country, they will rise up. And I mean, bringing democracy top down to Iraq doesn't work. We've seen that. You take him out. If the people wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein, like every other case through Iraq's history, they would have risen up and taken him out, or there would have been a coup, or whatever would have happened. They replaced him. I mean, I'll let, I'll let Joe take it from No, I, I think that uh, Mrs. Alex, is it? Uh, you raised, I mean, a, a really a tough question, and it's one that's been plaguing uh, politicians and statesmen for, for well, many, many years. I mean, uh, uh, there is a mechanism. It may not be perfect, but uh, it has been used, and that is that uh, if you have Security Council agreement, then uh, military force could be used to protect uh, people who are being killed by their own leaders. Uh, the problem is you can't get agreement at the Security Council. And why not? Because often, nine times out of ten, it, the humanitarian intervention has really got other motives. Uh, you know, Hitler used humanitarian intervention uh, for his attack on, or his desire to get to the Sudetenland away from Czechoslovakia. And he eventually was successful. Uh, but even Hitler at that point insisted that Benish, the president of Czechoslovakia, sign the agreement that he was handing over the Sudetenland. I mean, he, Hitler, even Hitler went along with the process of the law which I'm afraid our neighbor to the south doesn't always do. But even look at Darfur. I mean, it's an extremely complicated situation there. Uh, but because some eager humanitarians have pulled uh, Bashir before the International Criminal Court, his reaction to that is probably going to be to expel all of the aid agencies from Darfur. And estimates are that that mean, may mean the death of two million people in addition to what's already happened there. Uh, through starvation. So if you are going to do humanitarian intervention, then you have to, I think at least, do no harm. I mean, you've got to do it in a way that is not going to harm the people you're trying to help. I mean, when NATO told us they were bombing Serbia and Kosovo for humanitarian reasons, well, that's an oxymoron. You can't bomb people for humanitarian reasons. So. While the, the rules are there, they're in, you know, and that was part of the reason for the UN Charter. They just come through two cataclysmic world wars in the 20th century, uh, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the people who framed the UN Charter realized that something had to, we were going into the 21st century, we had to have some rules that prevented people from killing themselves over international disputes. And that's what the Charter was all about. And it worked, it was working reasonably well. Uh, but when, you know, there was no longer any balance of power between the Soviet Union and the uh, Western world, and the Americans became a the only power that was any, of any significance, many of us, quite a number of us, felt that now things are pretty well settling down. It may not be the end of history, but at least Pax Americana will follow the rules and all of the words that they talk about, democracy and the rule of law and liberty, finally maybe begin to prevail. But they were the first ones to break it. And they have continued to do so. Not just in Kosovo or Afghanistan and Iraq, but even before that in Panama, in, in a long list of countries, in Central America. 
So no, the the uh, the issue of whether you should intervene for humanitarian reasons is a real one, and sometimes I think there are examples when you should intervene. Rwanda was a classic case, but nobody was willing to do it. And that's the other thing about the responsibility to protect and humanitarian intervention. Who's going to do it? Who's going to put the lives of their soldiers at risk for people in a faraway country they know nothing about? So it's a tricky one, but uh, I, my own view is that there is provision in the UN Charter to do that, to intervene militarily if you have Security Council approval. And that we should, until we get something better, let's follow the rules. They're there. We have a question on the right here. Um, if you do not like the idea of humanitarian intervention, uh, what solutions do you have for future mass violence? Like, um, like what, uh, who should take care of the problem Like, if NATO is not good enough? Well, this issue of mass violence, uh, who should take care of it? Uh, we have a very selective memory. I, I raised the issue of Vietnam just because that's one of, been one of the biggest holocausts of our time. Six million dead, wounded uh, in Vietnam. Now, nothing has been done. The Vietnamese were promised reparations by President Nixon. None of those who perpetrated these actions against Vietnam, a little country that never threatened anyone, uh, it's the United States that bombed them. So you have to be very careful about this. What we generally see is this selective looking at small countries, whereas uh, Ambassador Bissett mentioned there are other motives. And this is why I want to caution the previous uh, questioner as well to study about Zimbabwe and study about Sudan, the oil resources. Take a look at all of that before we start believing what we're being told in our media. As th these patterns are so predictable, they trump up the demonization of the Serbs because uh, the U.S. wants to occupy Kosovo, and then we then we talk about Iraq as being such a horrible place with a dictator, while never talking about how much oil Iraq has under the ground. So these are the kind of things we have to take a very clear, hard-nosed look at by the citizens before we start running off to saying we're going to protect this country or that country around the world. The United States does not have a record, if I may say so, of being altruistic and going and protecting the civil rights of poor countries around the world. So that's what we have to be very careful of. And we have to, the one thing we can do as Canadians is to get, try to make sure that our country takes its own position on the world stage. We have at times, as I mentioned, opposed this kind of action when Mr. Diefenbaker opposed the Americans' intervention in Cuba and the blockade. Canada still opposes that blockade. The Americans try to prevent any trade with Cuba. But there was a million Canadians went down there as tourists last year. So Canadians are voting with their feet in terms of trying to do something. That's a humanitarian intervention, I suppose, to help the economy of Cuba. But uh, we have to be very careful this idea of allying ourselves with the use of uh, smart bombs uh, and depleted uranium as a way of intervening in global countries around the world. I think I'll just, just pick up on the, the notion of this uh, idea of uh, humanitarian intervention. Humanitarian intervention is something which is popular. It always has been. I mean, historically, people have been duped into believing that's why they're going off to war. Um, Canadians joined up to go fight in South Africa to fight the Boers because they were being told that the, the Boers were bayoneting babies in nurseries. Uh, beginning World War I, we were told that the evil Hun, as he was coming through Belgium, was bayoneting babies in the hospitals. Everybody, I mean, now how can you possibly resist that? We've got to go fight these evil doers. Up, up until it was 1990, 91, when the first Gulf War, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, we were told very emotionally that when the Iraqi troops came into Kuwait, they bayoneted babies in incubators. Ergo, we must go off and fight these evildoers. It was all a hoax. All three were a hoax. I mean, how many times can we get fooled by the same bayoneting of babies? There's not a person or a people on earth that is so evil as to bayonet babies in incubators. But we will fall for that one every single time, and guys will go up to the recruiting agency and go fight those evildoers. Um, and then anyway, we just be careful when you're watching. Watch out for the evil media, of which I happen to be one. Okay, we'll take a question here. Can I just make one final comment? Uh, often those who advocate humanitarian intervention do so because it sounds like a good principle and, and uh, they support it and, and they get a lot of uh, credit and claim because of it. But uh, our foreign minister at the time of Kosovo was Lloyd Axworth, who was one of the foremost proponents of humanitarian intervention and of uh, the responsibility to protect. But he knew that the bombing was wrong 
uh, he never said anything about it. He was the foreign minister at the time. So those, when it comes down to really putting putting up or shutting up, he shut up. We'll take the question here from the left. Hi. Um, no, I just want to know, now that the USSR has disbanded and uh, NATO's official goal has been, I guess, theoretically completed, um, what do you think it's supposed to uphold now that it's 60 years old and that uh, could you still see countries like Zimbabwe that still have problems with Mugabe and the cholera epidemic since August and like the famines in North Korea? I just want to know what you think NATO is supposed to uphold today as an organization now that the USSR is fallen? Well, I think I've answered that before. I, I think if NATO went back to its original Article 1, uh, refusing to use force or threatening to use force, and acted in accordance with the principle of the UN Charter, uh, that would be fine. That would be fine. But they're not doing that. They're not doing that. I mean, they're holding military exercises throughout Western Europe. I mean, it's a, an enormous military organization now. And NATO's leaders want to expand it. They're going to bring in Croatia and Macedonia in a couple of weeks. They're, they're urging Georgia and Ukraine to join. Uh, you know, so far the French and the Germans have resisted getting Georgia and the Ukraine in because they realize that's a provocation to, to uh, Russia. But the UN may need a military arm to intervene where there's consensus that uh, uh, they should do so to, um, for the reasons of humanitarian intervention. But let it, let it be done by the United Nations, not by the United States, or not by any other individual country, and certainly not by NATO. NATO is a military organization. It wants to intervene militarily. That's what keeps it going. That's what keeps the budgets flowing. They want wars. They want uh, action. Uh, and, and they're determined to get it, and they'll provoke it, because they're done. And we've seen it. I think, was, was it you who touched on earlier, Joe, how many, how many countries that the U.S. have soldiers based in? 160 countries, and of course a lot of those, they have a presence in most of the NATO countries in Europe. This is something where, I mean, it's definitely the Americans that want to continue and to perpetuate NATO because, of course, that allows them that much more influence in Europe. And that was something which we talked about earlier, about putting in the big base in Bonn, Steel, and Kosovo, allowed them to transfer a lot of the troops that they had still stationed in Germany down to there. It isn't still the same big military base that it was. Most of those American troops have been drawn off into Iraq and Afghanistan, where, again, they're deployed now in even more countries than they were. Um, but I don't think there's enough resistance within NATO yet to tell the Americans, that, especially from the European countries, that they want out from under it. Uh, if they did, we might see a whole different amalgamation. With it. I mean, we're seeing in the genesis of Euroforce, et cetera, things coming together, which means the expulsion of the U.S. influence, which, again, I don't think we're quite there, quite ready yet. But there is no obvious reason or rationale for NATO to exist as a military alliance, an alliance against who as they continue to grow and, and gain more membership. I mean, who would be I mean, even a, a potential enemy to that force? doesn't make any sense. The, uh, you, you mentioned two, uh, two problems there. You mentioned the famine in North Korea and the cholera pending cholera epidemic in Zimbabwe. Well, as, as, uh, as was pointed out uh, here, NATO is a military alliance. That is not going to solve the problem of cholera or famine. There are other ways of doing that. In fact, in Zimbabwe, uh, we should lift the sanctions that are uh, crippling the, the, the country as a first step in terms of allowing some kind of uh, medical supplies and all of the other things that are needed there. So, so uh, the question of who's doing which institution you want to use, it, uh, it, these, it's not a military response that's required there. And uh, it was, uh, I hope that everybody will uh, We'll buy Scott Taylor's book out in the back. I'm going to plug my own book as well. Uh, yeah, in my book, I document uh, uh, over 170 times the United States has intervened in other countries around the world, invaded, occupied, or otherwise uh, overthrown governments. And so uh, we have to take a look at this, uh, looking at these little countries. This inter International Criminal Tribunal uh, for Yugoslavia is only trying one side of the conflict. When, when Professor Mandel took his dossier there about uh, the war crimes being committed by NATO, they refuse to investigate because, of course, the whole thing is being financed by the United States. So these are the things that you've got to look a little deeper at. What is the problem we want to correct, and what's the best way to use 
use it, and we've been far too quick to say we want to intervene, we're going to overthrow the government, and we're going to uh, bomb and leave a legacy of agony and suffering for a long time, which is going to exacerbate it, as we've seen in Yugoslavia, exacerbate the problem. Can I just mention, bef before we ha handle another question, something that is, makes me very nervous and I'm concerned about. Um, we know a lot about Kosovo now that we didn't know at the time, but um, the Americans uh, uh, delegated down to the def their defense intelligence agency the job of uh, going into Kosovo and training KLA fighters in Albania and some in Turkey, arming them, equipping them, and training them, and sending them back into Kosovo to murder Serbian mayors, uh, police, any Albanian who didn't uh, uh, support their cause. I mean, this was well before the trouble started there. The Americans were supported by MI6, the British Secret Service. They had help from FAS, the, the Secret Air Services of the British, and they had the help from three private military firms. And that they were sent back into the, the, the KLA who were trained, were sent back fully equipped and trained to destabilize Kosovo and to cause trouble there, which would give NATO an opportunity of having to intervene. Uh, we didn't know that at the time, but these intelligence agencies uh, are, are working all the time. And the growth of the mercenaries, these military private military armies that, Scott, you ran into, I think, in, certainly in Iraq, is also a grave concern because there's no responsibility for them. They were used in the Balkans uh, during the troubles there. They're certainly used in Kosovo. They're being used in Iraq. Uh, they're former military people. They have connections with the, with the United States government, but, uh, you know, the government will not take responsibility for anything that happens as a result of them. In addition to that, the Americans are very good at going into countries uh, with non-governmental organizations, heavily financed by the American State Department, <coughs> to cause destabilization. And they, they will get uh, <coughs> organizations within a country to promote democracy and freedom and so forth. Uh, but in effect, they're there to destabilize the country. We saw that happening in, in Yugoslavia and Serbia with Otpor, I think it was called, uh, massive amounts of money. Uh, we've seen it happening in Ukraine with the Orange Revolution. Was it the Orange one in the Ukraine? In Georgia, the, the Rose, I think, Rose Revolution. These are all uh, non-governmental organizations sent into a country to prom so-called promotion of democracy, but it's there to cause trouble. Uh, and it's certainly done that in Georgia. I mean, uh, in July, prior to the Georgian attack on Abkhazia and South Ossetia, all of July, the Americans were there training uh, Georgian troops with Israeli specialists to conduct a, a blitzkrieg-type attack on South Ossetia on the eve of the Olympics, thinking that they would overpower little Ab Abkhazia in 48 hours and it would all be over. Uh, of course, they forgot that the Russians knew all all along what they were doing and were prepared to stop them. But uh, there are many, many ways that, uh, that uh, particularly the Americans are operating now to, to destabilize the world and come in as the, uh, you know, the power that's going to bring democracy and freedom to them. Thank you. I, we have three more. <laughs> Thank you. That was we have three more questions. Uh, I think that we have three more questions. I should, I should mention that it's quarter to two, and our next session begins actually at two o'clock with a reading of a statement by Dr. Diana Johnstone, who um, will be read. This will be read by Goran Mihalovic. Uh, so I'll take the three more questions that I see. And I just want you to keep in mind that we have about a 15-minute limit. Okay, go ahead. Well, then, throughout the history, Canada never. Since throughout the history, Canada never joined the Americans to invade other countries. So why did we break the rule to invade Kosovo and Afghanistan? Is it besides the economic issue? Is it besides the which? Did you say what was your last word? Besides the economic issue. Well, that that is a very very good question. Uh, why has Canada more and more abandoned its independent role on the world stage? And uh, 
uh, I think that it has something to do with the fact that we're more and more giving up control of our own economy. And uh, that's what I wrote my book about. My book is called The Fight for Canada. And, it, you know, after the Second World War, we had the world's third largest uh, merchant marine fleet. We had, uh, we developed uh, the Avro Aero, the world's fastest jet interceptor. We, we, we killed those programs, and we've now become more and more integrated into the U.S. military establishment, and our leaders are more and more following uh, the U.S. line. And I think if we want our country to survive as an independent nation, we're going to have to more and more take things back in our own hands. And on the world stage, Canada can play a much different role than simply, simply helping the United States uh, conquer other countries or seeing our resources, instead of being used in Canada, you know, for example, our oil in Western Canada, we're shipping it straight south to the United States, getting almost nothing out of it uh, after uh, four decades of sending our oil south to the United States. Alberta is in a deficit. Canada hasn't saved a single penny from, uh, from those exports, whereas Norway has, a, has saved $400 billion in their heritage fund from exporting their oil because they've kept their oil industry in Norwegian hands. So the results of us giving away our industry mean we lose jobs, we lose money, and we end up simply following the tune of someone else. I'm a farmer. I know that if someone else owns my land, I get to, they get to say jump and I get to say how high. And it's almost like that for a country, unless we control our own means of production in the country and, and control our east-west trade. We give all that away. We end up finding our leaders simply following the, the strong voice from south of the border and the drumbeat from south of the border. But uh, the, the, that's uh, my uh, thoughts on it. Um, I think in, in 99, I mean, getting involved with the, the NATO bombing was something which Canada, I mean, was surprised to us to watch it very closely that we would take such a major role. We did 10% of the bombing. Um, people at the time we were able to sell the majority of the public were buying into what the propaganda was. Obviously, people like my colleagues on the panel here didn't buy into it. We knew better. Uh, it's not a proud moment in Canadian military history. If you go to the Canadian War Museum, there is not a single exhibit dedicated to that 78-day bombing campaign when we dropped 10% of the bombs. There's nothing. It mentions our peacekeeping in the Balkans. It mentions what we're doing in Afghanistan now. And you'll hear over and over again that the, the, the word that for the first time at war in Afghanistan since Korea. They completely gloss over the fact that we dropped all those bombs. It is not a proud moment. They never got a unit decoration for that. those squadrons. Dropping bombs from 23,000 feet on innocent people isn't something, and I think that I'm, I'm not proud that we did it, but I'm proud of the fact that we, we understand that it's a dirty little secret. Afghanistan, we got involved through the back door. It was the International Security Assistance Force, which did have a UN sanction to go in and provide a stabilization force after the Americans invaded and toppled the Taliban. That was something which was in keeping with Canadian ideals. I mean, obviously the Americans had done this without sanction, but now that it was done, we needed to, to build it back up out of, the, out of the ashes. We participated in that. But then our military commanders took us on a different path, sort of drove us down into Kandahar, and now we're involved in a combat mission, which most Canadians, and believe it, most of the brass don't understand how we ended up at that position. So it wasn't something completely divergent from our initial ideals and goals, but it was something which we sort of morphed into, and now we're, we're beating our chest and we're taking on a combat role. Well, I haven't much to add to that. I mean, uh, of course, the reality is when you're a small country like Canada is in terms of population, and you're living next to a superpower, you have to be conscious of not trying to provoke or alienate them too much. I mean, 90-some percent of our trade depends on the Americans, and they're not beyond using that as, a le as leverage. I mean, uh, uh, quite clearly, the, the Canadian government did not want to recognize Costco independence. They knew it was wrong. They knew it was a violation of the UN Charter, a violation of the Helsinki Final Accords that we signed, and a violation of international law. And they held off for a while. But uh, then we needed extra help uh, in Afghanistan, in Kandahar. And uh, Condoleezza Rice came dropping into the country, into Canada on a visit and said, of course, that they were going to supply, what, 30,000, 3,000 3, Marines for Kandahar. And I think a day later, we announced uh, that we were following the Americans and recognizing the independence of Kosovo. Uh, that was wrong, but I can understand why they do it. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that Canada is now a country that should simply say, sorry, we're not going to get involved. We don't agree with, uh, with the policy. Uh, you know, you, you're not helping your friend if you let him 
drive home drunk. And quite often, it seems to me that US, U.S. foreign policy is is following kind of a drunken road, and we should step in and say, sorry, we're not going to do that. I mean, uh, some members of NATO still haven't recognized Kosovo. Slovakia hasn't. Greece hasn't. Spain hasn't. Cyprus hasn't. And there may be one more that hasn't. Romania. Uh, they said, no, this is wrong. We're not going to do it. Uh, and I think occasionally if we did stand up and did what we know was the right thing to do, the Americans perhaps would listen. But we haven't as yet got, got to that point, I'm afraid. Part of the other problem is that, and it goes back to my point about intelligence services, uh, during the, the troubles in Yugoslavia and, all, and a lot of other parts around the world, the intelligence that we get comes from American sources. We don't have an intelligence service that operates outside of Canada. So you, if you're sitting as a Canadian representative at the NATO table, what you're reading and listening to are Americans telling you what's happening in these countries. And they're not always telling you the truth. Uh, in addition to that, our members of parliament are not particularly interested in foreign affairs. Uh, you know, the, when, the war, when the bombing started and the MPs woke up to the fact that their air force was bombing uh, Serbia, uh, as I said before, most of them had no idea where Kosovo was. They hadn't been following events in the Balkans. They're not interested. And then uh, when they were asked during the bombing to debate on the issue, all of their speeches had to be written guess, by, guess where? Uh, in the Department of National Defense or in, or in the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs. And as the members would come in, for the, uh, they, these sessions were all held at night, so there were very few MPs sitting around. But those that did go in, from the government side were handed sheets of paper with uh, everything written out for them to, to participate in the debate. Not one of them would have been able to debate on his own feet. They didn't know enough about it. So that's also part of the problem. And the, I should keep on going because it's not only the MPs, the press don't know what's going on. And, uh, you know, most people are more interested in watching desperate housewives than they are watching the news. So okay. unless you have a knowledgeable and alert public, your politicians are going to get away with murder. And that's what they've been doing. We're going to take um, one question here. Uh, I'm afraid we have gone a half hour over time. I'll leave it to you guys if you can take this, this, the last question. Are you able to? Can we take two more questions? Okay, I'll collect the questions. So that's another way of doing it. I'll collect the questions and then uh, I'll leave it to the speakers. So could you go ahead and ask your question? Uh, I have a simple quick question. Uh, in the future, do you see any progress that can take place in Kosovo between the people? Okay, I'll take that. Any progress in Kosovo? And then this one? Yeah, I just want to say this has been a really interesting afternoon, but truly depressing. So my question is, what do we do? Uh, things don't seem to be ch changed. They, they seem to be getting worse. The pattern remains the same. Uh, we can't believe our politicians. We can't uh, believe most of the press. And the opposition is so overwhelming. Uh, what do we do as individuals? We do our best, but it doesn't seem to be good enough. Okay, change in Kosovo. What do we do? And the last one. My question concerns the uh, roadside bombs in Afghanistan. I don't understand why um, our Canadian military allows our soldiers to go on these patrols and play Russian roulette. Maybe you'll be lucky you won't get blown up. But if you get blown up, oh well, there's another soldier gone, you know, part of our duty. Isn't there some other way of being in Afghanistan and not being blown up by roadside bombs? Okay, so I'll leave it to the panelists to answer those three questions. Okay, I'll answer the last question first. Um, if we're doing counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, it means we have to maintain a presence. You can't simply hide inside your base. Uh, and that's the problem is that if we go out there to do what they call presence patrols, it means we put ourselves at risk. The fact is, we're not doing enough to get involved with the people. The only way we're ever going to defeat the IEDs is if we gain the trust of the local Afghan people. To do that, we should have learned by now to speak some of their language. We've been there seven and a half years. Our guys have had three tours. That means 18 months in country. They don't speak a word of Pashto. Can't even give a simple greeting. Cannot interrelate with the people. Cannot protect the people. Cannot protect themselves. If they cannot protect themselves, those night letters that come to the Afghan citizens and civilians warning them against cooperation, 
they're to be they're to be listened to because obviously the Taliban still have a, have a bite. Flying our guys from base to base in helicopters and landing them in separate places, we may as well just bring them home. I mean, and I'm not saying that what we should be doing. If we need to focus on training the Afghan army to bring it up to speed, it should have been done seven and a half years ago. We should be well on the way. We haven't been doing that. So I mean, your answer, but we add armor to the vehicles. We we have radar they can look under the ground now we've got UAVs that patrol those routes they figured out our tactics they, they plant a dummy IED we go out to disarm it when we drive back they hit us with a new ID these people have had all the time in the world they drove the Soviets out in nine years they'll drive us out in 10 or 11 as they say the Afghan people say you may have the watches we have the time they live there they will they will drive us out one at a time one old artillery shell at a time each of our vehicles costs $4 million. We've lost like 73 of them. Do the math. I mean, we're replacing these things. That's not just the soldiers' lives. It's costing billions of dollars of, of military hardware. Each one of those vehicles that is destroyed is worth more than 10 Afghan villages in terms of the mud huts that they've got there. They've got the patients, et cetera. But I mean, it comes back to why are we there and what are we doing there? Obviously, everybody in the room knows we haven't been successful because it's worse now than it was seven years ago. And remember, they drove out Alexander the Great. <laughs> the, the question, uh, uh, because of short of time, I, I want to just talk about the, the, the last question in terms of what we can do, or the second question. One of the defining moments in my life in terms of being politicized was the Vietnam War. When I was a teenager, I read a book, I mean, I read an article in the Reader's Digest called The Blood Red Hands of Ho Chi Minh. And it talked about how the Vietnamese were slaughtering their own people and doing the most horrific things to them. And I wanted to, and the Americans were doing wonderful things, bringing democracy. I wanted to sign up with the American army and go and help them in what they're doing. In fact, I was uh, getting very close to doing that. And someone said, Here, you better read this book by Dr. Benjamin Spock. And in which he talked about, he was a well-known children's doctor, uh, who talked about what was really happening in Vietnam, a little country that had never been an imperial power, never invaded anybody, been trying to defend itself for 10,000 years against being taken over by China, and here we had the world's most advanced empire raining bombs on them for 10 years, chemical weapons, biological weapons, all of the things that, uh, that uh, are, are almost impossible to comprehend. The people of Vietnam lived in tunnels underground for years on end to, to, to survive. So anyway, I began to learn a little more and I realized no, there's something wrong here, and uh, I want to. I don't want our resources to be going to aid this kind of destruction of the third world, and I'd like to try to do something about it. So, when you ask what you can do, he says it's depressing. Well, one thing you've done is come here today. That's an important thing, and I know you've also helped to organize it, uh, and so that is an important uh, step. And uh, what we can do is to is to inform ourselves. There's a whole range of uh, wonderful articles and materials on, on the table at the back there. That's the second step to try to learn what's going on. And then we have to organize ourselves in terms of the best way to try to have an impact. And as you know, uh, I've been uh, tried to get involved in, in, a, in the political uh, the parties in this uh, country with the support of many, many people across the country. And uh, there's strong, strong resistance to a voice that actually speaks for Canada standing in, on its own two feet. And it's brave people like those of you in the audience, the people on the panel here who have come, come forward. Because most Canadians at heart, and Scott talks about the, uh, even in our war museum, we're not proud of the steps that we've taken when we've acted in a way that it goes against uh, our traditions and, and, our, and, our, and, our, and our best instincts. And I think what we can do in this country is make ourselves more independent so that we can be a voice that trades with countries around the world, that can be a voice that stands up for the smaller and the middle-sized countries. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's something proud that Canada can do, but we have a lot of work inside uh, our, our own country to, to change the direction we're going because we're headed down a different direction right now. We're headed down deeper and deeper into the U.S. to push is going on. I heard David Emerson the other day saying, we have a key moment now with the new president of the United States to increase the integration of North America. He wants to see us adopt the U.S. They want us to adopt the U.S. dollar and adopt a perimeter around North America so that we have one internal integrated uh, country in essence. So that's the struggle that we've, we've, we've got to do. So, but never forget that uh, in the end, it's the power of truth that can come out and the power of people organizing can make it can make a difference. So I want to leave you with that. I, I get the, the question on uh, progress in Kosovo. 
I can't be optimistic about that. I don't see any real hope there uh, under the present regime uh, in Kosovo. Uh, Thatchi, uh, uh, Aradonai, that, uh, uh, Jim Chetku, uh, they're all deeply involved in heroin trafficking and human trafficking. Uh, almost all of the uh, heroin trafficking in Western Europe goes through Kosovo. Uh, these these guys are not Democrats. They're not. Uh, uh, they're basically thugs and war criminals. And I don't think there's any hope, uh, really, that uh, under the present regime there that there can be reconciliation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the remaining a few thousand Serbs that are living there, apart from the, in the north are living in, in ghettos, barbed wire, their lives are in danger. Uh, I'm, the only thing that saved them is that the, uh, the present regime there the, the, of Kosovo realized that they can't massacre the remaining group of them without having their big brother, the United States, slapping them on the wrist for doing so. But the hope there is not, is not, uh, not good. Uh, I would, my own view is that northern uh, Kosovo, which is the majority population of Serbia, should continue what it's doing now and, and uh, that eventually uh, that part of uh, Kosovo at least will remain with Serbia. Uh, the Americans are not going to admit, nor will the NATO countries admit, that uh, they made a mistake in Kosovo. So uh, the long-range prospects are not good. The tragedy is that the United Nations 1244, the resolution that ended the fighting, was a very good resolution. And had it been followed, you'd have a much different picture in Kosovo today. Uh, what it did, it said that uh, now that the fighting has stopped, uh, all of the people who fled Kosovo should be returned to their homes. Uh, secondly, that the KLA should be disarmed. Uh, thirdly, that uh, uh, democratic institutions should gradually be built up in Kosovo so that the Serbs and Albanians can live together peacefully. Uh, and uh, one other provision was that the Serbian security forces, uh, a, a number of them, should be returned to Kosovo to guard the Christian holy places. Uh, because as, as has been pointed out, these are world treasures. They've been existing, you know, some of them from the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. Uh, and. Uh, those provisions, and there are a few more of them, if they had been followed by NATO, would have presented a much different picture in Kosovo today. And uh, the, the 1244 also allowed for a lot of autonomy uh, in, the, uh, in Kosovo uh, for the Albanian minority, which it was a minority in Serbia. So that, that could have really started, had that been done 10 years ago, uh, I think that you'd find a much different picture in Kosovo today, and that eventually, in the long run, Serbs and Albanians could live together there. They're tired of fighting, exhausted by the wars, uh, and uh, it's 50 percent unemployment. That will not improve as long as the, the main means of earning money there are through uh, narcotic smuggling, heroin smuggling, and human trafficking. So I'm not optimistic. It'll take a very, very long time. On that note, also, I might want to add that the next in the next session we will watch a film uh, which was made just this summer called Kosovo, Can You Imagine? And it shows the state of Kosovo today. So that will be coming up next. And I thank all of the speakers very much for their time.